All right, with death of Superman, Fuel of a Friend and Return slash Reign of Superman all covered, only this 2007 release Superman Doomsday movie is next up to go over. For some reason, they decided to start the DC Animated Original Movie Universe with that one, and like most of those early movies, it existed not only in a vacuum, but also in a state that to describe I would like to coin a new phrase as the sandbox principle. As what I mean by a sandbox is how franchises such as the DC Universe tend to have smaller franchises in it as their own sandboxes, such as the Batman sandbox, Superman sandbox, Wonder Woman sandbox, the Green Lantern sandbox, and so on. Sometimes the sandboxes are connected in one big sandbox, like with Young Justice, the Deck Hamu starting from Justice League War, and I suppose Luis may also count with that end credit scene in the first number. Movie. Then there are sandboxes that are shut and separated from the other sandboxes, until it comes the time to unite and connect them together. The DCAU is one of those cases in having started out with Batman the Animated Series, before it was then connected with Superman the Animated Series, and then leading up to the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited cartoons. But when it comes to the Superman Doomsday movie, it exists in a sandbox within sandbox, without any other sandbox sandboxes to be connected with it, which so means that this Superman and only this Superman exists in this version of the DC Universe, pretty much like in Superman and Lois, without any other DC heroes coexisting with him. That then affects the status quo we are thrusted upon in this movie, and how different it is from what DC and WB animation had done before. Especially when this was also their first time in not having the TV sensors telling them what they could not do. That is why we have the movie opening up with expositionary dialogue to make sure that we know Lex Luthor is a bad guy. What is it, the cure for cancer? Muscular dystrophy. I can cure every known case with a simple inoculation. Have Swan find a way to slow it to a crawl, turn it into a lifetime treatment program. Right now, it's a mere $300 billion windfall. And you need it to be a perennial. And Lois Lane is trying to expose him on the Daily Planet when she is not busy being in an adult relationship with Superman, who has not told her that he is Clark Kent. Mm -hmm. About Clark. Kent? While you're snuggling with me? I think I'm jealous. That is not a lot to unpack, as I was able to cover it all in one sentence and with two clips. But the way how most of it is presented in both shocking reveal and as if it's normal, this status quo is kind of eye-opening. I suppose those TV sensors and or higher-ups at Warner Bros. kept the creative team from having this movie use the DCAU animation style to keep it from being connected to Superman the Animated Series, because the tone shift would have been too much. Or they were unable to get the voice actors to come back for some reason. But enough rambling, let's move on to how this very first DC animated original movie universe film tried to adapt the death of Superman and then made up the rest of it as it went on. Okay, so Doomsday is buried underground just like in the comic, instead of being fired to Earth from the space, and he is released from his container in his DCAU model, instead of the containment suit that gets torn off from him during his rampage, maybe due to animation restraints, by a LexCorp team who have never seen the core movie. It's freaking unbearable. Yeah, forget Luthor and his happiness. I shall invent a new energy source by harnessing radiation emitted from the Earth's core. And rake in billions while we drown in our own sweat. Somebody didn't watch the core movie. And since this movie exists in its own isolated sandbox, the Justice League International are not there to catch up to Doomsday after he kills Bandy's mom, or to save the Anderson family who are also adapted out, while Booster Gold names the monster. This Superman robot at the Fortress of Solitude does it instead. The in question was biologically engineered to be the ultimate soldier. Precise, clinical, unstoppable. But its creators came to realize that it could not distinguish between friend and foe. Thus, this doomsday machine lives to extinguish any and all life forms. And after that, the fight between Superman and Doomsday is... 
Well, it is a fight Superman takes up as another challenge to get over. And the fight does have weight in having them throw each other across Metropolis as the people are witnessing it. Then there is a part where Superman throws Doomsday into a power station, which I think was added to the Superman vs Doomsday clone fight in BVS. Saving Lois and Jimmy in the helicopter like in the comic is acknowledged, while this clearly empty building goes down like in Man of Steel. And for some reason, Doomsday decides to stop beating up Superman to death when this young girl suddenly shows up crying for her mom. Well, that's dumb. That then gives Superman the opening to grab and fly Doomsday to space and back, in essentially using the submission and takedown moves on the monster, and use his last hate speech to walk and say goodbyes to Lois before fainting, or as this is trying to be an adaptation, before dying in her arms. By the way, I was told that Warner Bros. had given the crew this one demand that kept them from showing Superman's costume too damaged, and so we only have his cape tattered while Superman only starts to bleed from his mouth in the fight. Wow, that actually makes Superman look like he died while still having 80% of his health left while bleeding as a status effect. Also, the creative team apparently previously used the original fight choreography against Doomsday from the comic in the Justice League cartoon, with how the Justice Lord of Superman fought Doomsday, which... Yeah, that looks familiar, but how does that justify not using it again? I'm kind of surprised they didn't go for the bone twisting like in the comic. Were it an animation issue, a censorship issue? Or maybe they forgot how Superman actually killed Doomsday in his first fight with him. Future Pika here, I'm adding this part into the video while I'm still in the middle of editing it. Like I previously said, I was told by someone that Warner Bros. had a mandate for keeping Superman's costume from getting ripped open like in the comic. However, when I decided to ask my source on that information for visual evidence to show here in the video, or a recorded quote in saying it, my source was unable to provide me with it. Meaning that I cannot confirm of that mandate being a thing. But when looking at David Corres' wet Superman costume reveal, and some of the set leaks that people are claiming that this is supposed to be a battle damage costume, I would not be surprised if that mandate was still in effect, because this just looks like something that could be easily fixed with a washing machine. Not with a sewing machine or by getting a new suit, just by cleaning up the dirt from it. Okay, and back to the main video. Anyway, that is how Superman dies in this adaptation, without having told Lois that he is Clark Kent, who was sent away to Afghanistan earlier in the movie as a short-sighted plot point to have him be absent while Superman is dead. After that, the funeral for a friend section is pretty much skipped over, because this movie exists in an isolated sandbox without other DC characters attending it. Instead, we have this guy existing in Rex Leach's place in trying, and succeeding in buying Jimmy into working for him since Robin, Green Lantern and Wonder Woman are not there to help Jimmy hold his crown in saying no. Then comes the part where in the comic Lois called Ma and Pa Kent after Superman's funeral. But since Superman in this movie never told Lois that he is Clark, or Clark never told Lois that he is Superman, she instead gets a hunch to connect the dots when she sees Ma Kent alone attending the funeral. Ma Kent was so killed off before the events of this movie, and he won't be having that out-of-body experience in retrieving Clark's soul from the afterlife. At this point where Lois is then shown driving to Smallville on a hunch to meet Ma Kent at the Kent farm. I realize that this movie only has two or three daytime scenes, while the rest of it is set during an almost eternal night. However, for credit where credit is due, NH's performance as Lois in this scene in trying to open up to Ma Kent about having been in a relationship with the alter ego of her son is... From the Daily Planet. I know who you are, Miss Lane. My son talks about you quite often. He's talks, not, did it not talked. Has there been word from Afghanistan? I, I've been, well, I've been so worried. Mrs. Kent. She, you know, as well as I This 
is something that they... <sighs> died in Metropolis last week. Look, I'm not here as a reporter, I... Then why are you here, Miss Lane? I don't know exactly. Maybe it's just... Uh, I don't know if he told you, but we had been seeing each other for the past few months, uh, romantically. I know. Oh, yeah. I know the rest of the world... It's not the same it's if they had a knocked on. This is wrong. The whole stupid planet can know what it felt like to really love him, to be loved by him. Or how it feels now, every minute of every day, like, like I'm broken. Like, I'm the one that freaking monster pounded on. I was just about to put on a fresh pot of coffee. You look like you could use a cup. Good performance wasted on the material. It is a similar mistake that the Decamu two-parter also did in having Clark not have told Lois before dying or telling it too late. So their relationship does not have the same foundation as the comic version did. As good as Unhage's performance is in this scene, it feels wasted with this material she was given to work with. Speaking of which... Okay, and with that out of the way, Let's get to the rain portion of the movie with this attempt at being edgy. You did see to it that little mess was cleaned up. LexCorp was never there. Hmm. Fanatic. And neither were you. This is great. And this is this is in here for purely gratuitous adult reasons. When when Dwayne and I were plotting this thing out, we kept hearing from both Gregory and from the home video people, they said, well, you know what? This is just not seeming any more adult than an episode of Justice League. So Dwayne and I kept like going, well, how can we make this tougher? What can we do to make it, okay, he's going to kill Mercy. Why not? And it's like, okay, it's fine. It, it makes sense. It makes sense in Luthor's state of mind to do it. Mm -hmm. I love the way it's um, handled in silhouette, too. Mm -hmm. okay. So, to make it absolutely clear, this movie came out in 2007 when DC and Warner Bros. happened to be in the middle of a legal battle with the heirs of Jerry Siegel and Joe Suster. To explain that quickly, Superman debuted in 1938, and Superboy, as a younger version of Clark Kent, debuted in 1945, as an idea pitched by Jerry Siegel when he was serving in the military during World War II. During which both iterations of the character got a popularity boost, and when returning from his service, Siegel learned that DC had capitalized from his idea without informing him. By 1947, Siegel had convinced Schuster to sue DC for grievances over missed royalty payments as well as the ownership for Superman and Superboy, which by 1948 concluded with DC getting the ownership over Superman and Superboy staying in the ownership of Siegel and Schuster. They got paid a hefty stipend of missed royalties for the rest of their lives until Superboy stopped being used, but when it comes to the new Superboy who debuted in Ray of Superman. The heirs of Schuster and Siegel filed an another lawsuit against DC back in 2004, a decade or so after Schuster and Siegel had passed away. The court battle for Superman and Superboy's ownership lasted up until 2008, during which DC's ownership over Superboy was held in question and so, this movie was not allowed to use Superboy in it. The adaptation of the story where the character debuted was not allowed to use him. And so the filmmakers also decided to forego with Steel, Eradicator and Cyborg Superman as well, in favor of instead using a perfectly functional version of Bizarro. Yes, this Superman who shows up to save Lois and a school bus full of children from this edgy version of Toy Man is a Bizarro-like clone who never degenerates into looking like Bizarro. Like most versions, the clone whom I'm going to refer to as Perfect Bizarro is created by Lex Luthor who decided to react to Superman's death like this. Why did you leave me? Why? 
We had so much unfinished business. Who's your daddy? Yeah, it's like, because it, the last time we saw Luthor, he was like all kind of grieving and, and you know, depressed because Superman was dead and he had nothing to do with it. And, and I were just, just brainstorming ideas and, you know, we thought, okay, well, if Luthor clone Superman, what's he going to do with that clone? Yeah. And we thought, that besides just having Superman doing his bidding, you know, he'd be a puppet Superman with, you know, that Luthor pulls the strings. We thought, you know what, what would Luthor do with this guy? Realistically, he would put him in a red room under his power and beat the crap out of him with the night gloves every single night. But it's a weird mixture of pleasure, because clearly he's always wanted to do this, but it's also a punishment. It's this, why yeah. did you leave me thing? It's also part of the grieving. Again, it's sure. like this twisted five stages of, uh, yeah. of grieving that he's going through. And yeah, um, he's just sort of hovering in anger. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes into so, a secret room, and he's got the ultimate collectible. Remember when the comic version reacted like this? Gotcha. I win. I knew I'd bury you one day. You sanctimonious, self-righteous pain. I owned this town until you came along. There wasn't a man on earth who could stop me doing anything I pleased. And if anyone interfered, they were given a one-way ticket to hell. Well, now I'm back on top. And you can't do one blessed thing about it. You're dead. You're nothing. Metropolis is mine again. And you are an empty, lifeless, withering husk. Gotcha! You can tell this was the production team's first time with the gloves off and they were trying to be edgy with the making of this movie. It's kind of similar with the Batman vs. Dracula movie, which was also written by Dwayne Capizzi, but it does not have the same nuance as it is the first movie in a continuity, and it needs to establish all the needed things in the story as it goes forward. So, it's no wonder how this movie ended up being a standalone that was barely acknowledged in the future movies. I wouldn't miss this for anything. Your funeral. I already had one. But back to comparing how the latter half of this movie is trying to retell, not adapt Superman's return. Basically, it's told in Luthor's one-sided dialogue to Superman's corpse that he had his perfect bizarro do what Project Cadmus did in the comic, and then made its return debut as the resurrected Superman in stopping the edgy version of Toy Man, whom he then kills later in the movie in the most public way possible, while even giving an interview about why why he did it, because Toy Man's crime spree ended up having casualties where a child died. Several children hostage at a daycare center. After a prolonged standoff, the fugitive was apprehended by police just moments ago. But though Toy Man is now safely in police custody, there is a tragic element to the scene. Minutes before his capture, Toy Man took the life of young Katie Albert. She was only four years old. Here is where this story can only work in that sandbox I spoke of earlier, because if the return of Superman had gone like this after the funeral story had everyone from the people to other superheroes mourning over him, they definitely would have stepped in to question this Superman's validity based on his actions here. Then the main Superman is stolen from Luthor's possession by that Superman robot that named Doomsday and could have been used as the eradicator for this story, because its reasoning and justification for bringing Superman into the Fortress of Solitude to charge up his powers to resuscitate him is pretty much the same as what the eradicator told Superman in the comic when they were going after the cyborg Superman in the Engine City. That on this world, the laws of human death do not apply to you, kal -El. I only came to realize it 17 days after your apparent demise, when I was alerted to a single pulse of your biorhythmic signature. So my vitals... slowed to a crawl. To better enable you to heal. I had to await a second pulse 17 days later in order to find you. Yep, Superman was never really dead, just in a hibernation state where there were weeks between his heartbeats. Just like how it was in the comic. 
And then Superman has to spend time in the Fortress of Solitude to get back into shape by giving the female viewers some fan service. While he is busy with that, Luthor sends his perfect bizarro into what might as well be a wild goose chase to look up possible suspects who could have stolen Superman's body from him, but instead the perfect bizarro decides to look up himself in the mirror with his X-ray vision and ends up finding Luthor's contingency plan in his head. Lead. Only one thing it could be hiding. Kryptonite. <laughs> Huh. A safe Superman means a safe metropolis. At this point I should probably say more about the perfect Bizarro and how well he compares to mostly to Cyborg Superman. I suppose being a clone would give him an aspect of Superboy whom the movie was not allowed to use. He has a world view of Superman's values like the Eradicator, but pretty much nothing from Steel and in the end he is the final boss just like Cyborg Superman. Adam Baldwin does a double duty in voicing both Superman and the perfect Bizarro, and this one scene after saving a cat from a tree is a truly chilling example of, well just look at it. It really irks me when folks don't take responsibility for the little things. Don't get me wrong, I'm here to help. But every time I have to stop and sweat the small stuff, it potentially keeps me from attending to more urgent matters. Life-threatening matters. You may want to think about that the next time you leave the screen door open. This was a real missed opportunity to not have Adam Baldwin voice the cyborg Superman in fooling everyone that he was the real Superman while planning with Mongol to kill people to ruin Superman's legacy. But instead we have perfect Bizarro who creates different kind of tension by openly killing people and pretty much letting everyone unintentionally know that he is not the real Superman. That is not the boy I raised. Lois pretty much already figured it out when the perfect Bizarro recoiled from her trying to act romantic with him, and after seeing him fraternizing with Luthor, Lois goes to find evidence about it at LexCorp with some adult methods. There we get an incident where she and Jimmy find a cloning lab where Luthor probably doesn't want them to find out about him having certain other feelings towards Superman. Who's your daddy? I wonder if this movie inspired Mark Wade in writing Modius as the Lex Luthor XP in Irredeemable. Regardless, Perfect Bizarro does not consent in Superman's place, and then runs Luthor into the panic room with red sunlight and where he previously forced his fetishes onto him with the kryptonite gauntlets. In his continued rejection, the Perfect Bizarro locks Luthor inside the panic room and throws it out of the building in causing more of that different kind of tension. The news of it are then carried over to Fortress of Solitude, which similarly in hearing about the Eradicator's reputation causes Superman to decide that he has to go confront the perfect Bizarro. He does not go to Metropolis in a Kryptonian war suit or in his ship, but rather uses what little strength he has managed to gather during his out of resuscitation pod workout to fly there while wearing the black suit to absorb sunlight. By the way, look at that cloudy weather and how these soldiers are probably coerced into shooting at the perfect Bizarro with normal bullets. Superman, I have to ask you to step down. I don't think that would be in the city's best interests. You leave us no choice. Do they have kryptonite weapons? Well, Superman is the only one who has one of those, and after a somewhat better version of Over My Dead Body, or a less lame version of that line than what the Dekamu did, Superman and the perfect Bizarro fight for the next six minutes after Superman drops the kryptonite gun, which Lois and Jimmy need to get to him, and... Did that the first shot not have any effect? 
Like seriously? What the shit? If Superman had gotten his shot to shoot at the clone, wouldn't it have had the same effect when Louis shot him? Glue the kryptonite ammo to perfect Bizarro's chest with tar, and Superman ignites it with his heat vision. And that is how the perfect Bizarro dies in Superman's arms without breaking apart in looking like Bizarro in his final moments. Probably because that would have cost too much to animate. And after that, the movie does two completely stupid things in a row before it ends. The first thing is that Superman convinces Lois of his validity by kissing her in front of all of these witnesses. The second thing is that in the final scene we have Superman tell Lois he is Clark Kent by putting glasses on while they are in her apartment. The comic version did this much better by having Superman tell Lois that How to Kill a Mockingbird is Clark Kent's favorite movie. Pretty much after that public kiss, they can never be in a public relationship as Lois and Clark. Which is why this movie can only exist as a standalone in an isolated sandbox. And this final scene with the wounded Lex Luthor having the final word in his internal monologue barely ends up meaning less than nothing. If history has determined that gods can die, it is also proven that they may return from the dead. It would seem you can't be destroyed after all. So Ooh, deep. It would seem. Compared to the source material and that two-parter The Camus movie, Superman Doomsday is a warning example of early installment weirdness. As the first DC animated original movie universe film, it shows how the whole IP was stumbling to learn how to walk and figure out its limits in what it was and wasn't able to do. And as an adaptation of the death of Superman, it tried its best for the first half of it while being held back by multiple different factors. Factors which when looked at with hindsight, just says that they should have waited until later before doing it. And that said, it would have probably been a better idea to start out with the new frontier instead. Casting-wise, Adam Baldwin and Anne H were good choices for Superman and Lois Lane, but James Masters as Lex Luthor was not as good as in DC Universe Online. You've lost everything! No. I beat you. The Brainiac had returned. For years he'd been stealing the powers of Earth's protectors, but we were too busy fighting amongst ourselves to see the danger. With you three dead, Brainiac quickly eliminated the remaining heroes. The lucky ones died fighting. Finally, I alone survived. A rat in the walls of the Brainiac Construct. I have traveled through time to warn you. This is my past, but your future. And it means the end of humanity, so together, we must change it! Okay, I have talked enough about this movie. My next video before I'm going back to doing comparison reviews is a similar movie review like this on Wonder Woman Bloodlines. I have been asked to cover that for some time now, so while you wait for that video, like this one, comment what thoughts and opinions you have on Superman Doomsday, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe to my channel while checking out my other videos. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I'm doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.